This lecture is not intended to present any new information, but what it is intended to do is build on the last lecture and step you through calculation examples for two different lattices, a hexagonal lattice and a square lattice. So we start off, we have to define what our lattice looks like. And in this case, it has a obviously a square unit cell because we said that would be square. And it's filled with some dielectric constant epsilon two. And then in here is a dielectric cylinder of radius R and of dielectric constant epsilon one. And then the lattice spacing will be A. So if we were to draw an extended lattice, it might look something like this. And for the lattice in this example, the radius will be 0.35 times the lattice constant. And the dielectric constant of the hole will be 1. And the dielectric constant of the fill will be 9. And that corresponds to a refractive index of 3. Well, so what is it we might want to know about this lattice? Well, first, what are its direct lattice vectors? What does its Wigner Seitz primitive cell look like? How about the lattice vectors? How about the Berlouin zone? What about the irreducible Berlouin zone? How do we construct that? How do we identify the key points of symmetry? Uh, given all that, how do we construct a band diagram? What does that look like? And then the isofrequency contours. We might want to ask, where does it self-collimate, which we get from the iso contours. And then as a quick example, we will design a self-collimating lattice. And there could be a whole bunch more that we want to answer about this. But having stepped through this example, uh, hopefully whatever else you might want to learn about that lattice, it would be more intuitive to, to do that. So the first step is the direct lattice vectors. So we have a square lattice. So in fact, the, the primitive translation vectors just point along the edge of the unit cell. We have a T1 and a T2. And so given lattice spacing A, here's how we would express our T1 and T2. And the lower left, I'm showing T1 and T2 in the middle of an extended lattice. So that we can write just from observation. That's pretty simple. Next, we would like to construct the Wigner Seitz primitive cell. And uh, there's different ways we could define the Wigner Seitz primitive cell. In this case, it will outline the same area of space, but we could translate that anywhere in the lattice and still define a unit cell. So the thing about a unit cell is that it has to completely describe the lattice. So we take the unit cell and stack it on top of itself or next to itself in an array without any overlap or without any voids. It has to completely and perfectly reconstruct the lattice. So that's a unit cell. And in this case, our unit cells, uh, we have one of two options. We could place our dielectric cylinders at the corners or we could place a dielectric cylinder at the center. So this one in the center is probably the more conventional one, but certainly not the only possibility. So this unit cell is what's outlined here, along with the primitive translation vectors in blue. And the unit cell on left is shown over here. So either one work. Those are the Wigner, Wigner sites primitive cells for this lattice. On to the reciprocal lattice vectors. We start off with the, the direct lattice vectors. We calculate the reciprocals using our equations. And we end up with the reciprocal lattice vectors. Interestingly, these are still pointing along just the x, y, z axes, except instead of having magnitude a, which we did on the direct lattice, our reciprocal lattice vectors have a magnitude of 2 pi divided by a, which makes intuitive sense following our last lecture. So now we have the primitive translation vectors of the reciprocal lattice. So here's the, the two lattices side by side. We know they have different magnitudes. Um, one could be larger than the other. Uh, that, that won't have a lot of meaning to us, but we do need to keep the dimensions of them straight. And one thing you'll notice, I drew a dot in here. The, the reciprocal lattice, th there's not really a geometry we can assign to it. I just drew that as a dot as a site in the lattice. It's not conveying that given whatever patterns in the direct lattice, we can construct a pattern in the reciprocal lattice. That doesn't make sense to do. The Berlouin zone. Well, here's the Berlouin zone for the reciprocal lattice. And remember, the Berlouin zone is constructed exactly like we construct Wigner site cells. It's just that we do it in reciprocal space. And when we do that, here's where we are. 
Both axes will go from negative pi over a to pi over a. So it's a total span of 2 pi over a, and the same thing vertically. So that's our Berlouin zone. We can solve for a number of different things, and if we solve at every point in this area, we can reconstruct at any other point in the in k space. So our, our solution is completely isolated to the Berlouin zone. If we know everything here, we know everything about the lattice. Okay, so given the Berlouin zone, there's usually additional symmetry that we can exploit then to reduce the Berlouin zone down to even a smaller region from which we can we completely know the lattice. So the first thing, does it have up and down symmetry? Well, we can take our unit cell, we can flip it up and down, and yeah, it has additional symmetry. So our, our irreducible Berlouin zone starts off being the full Berlouin zone, but because of this up-down symmetry, we can restrict it to either the top or the bottom. So here I'm retaining the top. Well, it also has left-right symmetry. That means the left and the right halves of the Berlouin zone will be mirror images of each other. So we can really restrict ourselves to just one quadrant now. Well, there's even more symmetry. It turns out if we rotate this unit cell 90 degrees, it has 90 degree rotational symmetry. So that means our irreducible Berlouin zone reduces down to this half triangle. Any point within this half triangle, we can map to a point in the missing other half of the triangle. And then given that quadrant, we can mirror image that to this quadrant, and we can mirror image the entire top half to reconstruct the bottom half. So essentially, every point in this entire area could be mapped to a single point within the irreducible Berlouin zone. And so if we know everything within the irreducible Berlouin zone, we know everything about the lattice, but we've greatly reduced our numerical problem. Now we want to identify the key points of symmetry. And it turns out there is a convention with the naming of these key points of symmetry. And I've given you a handout that has the, that has the, the convention. So for this case, we would look at the, the cubic unit cell, the simple cubic. And we would look at how things are labeled. And if we look at this in-plane triangle here, we see that the key points of symmetry are labeled gamma, x, and then m along the diagonal. So we stick with that, gamma, x, and m. And we get that from our convention, which I've summarized in a handout. And I'll also make that available on the, the web page. I haven't done that yet, but by the time you're listening to this, it will be there. Now we need to calculate where are those key points of symmetry are? We've labeled them, well, where are they? And we would like to have those in terms of the reciprocal lattice vectors. Well, gamma is always at zero. X, we notice here's T1. Here's our uh, reciprocal lattice vector T1. We notice X is at half of this distance. So X is just half of T1, which ends up being this. M will be half of T1, plus half of T2, and that brings us along the diagonal. So M is half of T1 plus half of T2, or this is M. So now we've actually calculated the positions of the key points of symmetry around the irreducible Berlouin zone. To construct a band diagram, to be complete, we would have to calculate a full set of eigenfrequencies, eigenmodes, within the entire irreducible Berlouin zone. And that can be hundreds or thousands of points. Instead, it is said that most of the time, or almost always, the band extremes occur at the key points of symmetry. So instead of having to fill in this entire area, we can just march along the perimeter with a lot fewer points. So here's our Berlouin zone. Here's the path we'll take. We'll start at gamma. We'll march along this lower box to x. We'll march upward to M, and then downward back to gamma. So the horizontal axis along our band diagram will look like this. Gamma to X to M to gamma. And that's the horizontal axis in our band diagram. Next, numerically, we have to calculate all of the values in between. So we know we start at gamma, we know we go up to X, but we probably want a bunch of points in between. So gamma to x to m to gamma, 
we need to fill in this array beta. So we know we start at gamma, so we start at zero, zero, and we go all the way up to zero, zero, and in the median here, we go through X, and then through M, and then through gamma, and we want enough points along here so that when we plot our, our eigenvalues, they form lines, obvious lines, and those become our bands. So now we set up a loop, and we iterate over all of those values we just calculated on the previous slide. For each one of those, we calculate all the eigenvalues, and we plot those vertically. Then we go to the next point, plot all the eigenvalues vertically, next value, and so on. And if we have enough points, what we see is that these fall on lines. They form bands, so we're already looking at our bands. Now, this is a very ugly figure. So the next step is to make this look much more professional. A few things I like to do. One, we don't want the horizontal axis labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 50. We want to label our key points gamma, x, m, and gamma. The next thing is we probably want our bands to be smooth, continuous lines. So we don't plot them as dots. Also, our eigenvalue comes out as k naught squared, our free space wave number squared. Well, instead, we want to scale this to omega a over 2 pi c. I'm not sure why we write it that way, but in fact, that's just a over lambda. And this is a very, very useful scaling when we, we see a, a lattice with a band gap or something, and we want to place that band gap at a desired frequency, which we can then calculate wavelength from, and we can figure out what lattice constant it takes to do that. So it is a very convenient scaling. We want to give the band diagram a title. We want to label the axes. And also, we would never ever want to generate a, block di block, uh, a band diagram without providing the Berlouin zone and the irreducible Berlouin zone and how we labeled our key points of symmetry. Sometimes you'll also see the unit cell or even an extended lattice drawn in here. That's kind of optional but we definitely have to include in our band diagrams the, the Berlouin zone, the irreducible Berlouin zone, and how we've labeled our key points of symmetry. So here's a final band diagram. One thing that's kind of fancy here is you notice I've colored the bands. And so this resolves the band crossing problem. If we didn't do that, for example, here we are in this dark black band if they were all the same color, and we come to this point, how do we know that this band doesn't turn and come up this way? Well, we might say, well, the bands have to be rather continuous, but it gets hard to see. And so if we can keep consistency in our bands and resolve this band crossing issue, then, which we talked about last semester, then we can see all the separate bands and how they cross. So I would call this a final band diagram. Solid bands, it's color-coded, uh, the axes are labeled, the, the Berlouin zone, the irreducible Berlouin zone, key points of symmetry are all there. So that's a nice looking band diagram. We can play around with line widths and stuff like that depending uh, how you're presenting it, whether it's in a paper or presentation for sure. Now I mentioned the band diagram is incomplete. Really, to be complete, we need to go iterate through the entire irreducible Berlouin zone and calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors at every single part. So, what if we did that? Well, here's the full Berlouin zone on the left. So if we set up a double loop, and we iterated through this, calculating all of the eigenvalues, and plotting those now in the direction coming out of the plane, well, let's take this and, and put it down in this angle. So this square is the Berlouin zone. So this red square on the left is this black square now shown in the sort of the the, the planar perspective. And then the eigenvalues are plotted vertically. And if plotted close enough, we see that they form these continuous bands. That is a complete band diagram for a two-dimensional photonic crystal. But a lot more computationally intensive to get here than it was just a simple band diagram. And that's the power of the band diagram. Well, we want to now calculate the index ellipsoids, or also called the isofrequency contours. So we look at the full band diagrams, and we imagine a plane at a constant frequency. So we're going to look at a plane that will slice through this band, and what we would have at the intersection, if we plotted that intersection, that would be an isofrequency contour 
and that is also what we're interpreting as the index ellipsoid at that frequency. So if we do that over here, here's the first band all by itself, and here are the isocontours. So this would be an intersection of a plane in this axis intersecting this band. And what we see is the first order band has rather circular isocontours or index ellipsoids. And that makes sense. This lower band is very, very long wavelength. It's really just seeing the average dielectric constant, average refractive index of the lattice. Things get more interesting as we go to higher order bands. Here's the second order band. And if we construct the isocontours, notice they take on much, much different shapes. These are looking much more square. And I always like to say that the, the isocontours tend to resemble the Berlouin zone. So the Berlouin zone square, these tend to look a little bit square, although as we deviate away, not exactly square, but much more square than what's on the previous side. So suddenly, in periodic structures, our isocontours or index ellipsoids can take on some very, very strange shapes, and this can be very useful. We usually don't draw the bands and the isocontours on the same plot. A little bit confusing and we can't make out the detail in the isocontours. This is much more common for how it's done. On the left are the isocontours of the first band. We see mostly circles. And then we have on the right we have the isocontours of the second band and we see squares. And it turns out squares is something very interesting. And we get self-collimation at the squares. And that's because uh, take this as the center frequency of self collimation This entire span of wave vectors, we have a beam that wants to diverge, but in fact the, the power is forced to go straight over, the entire, over this entire face of that isocontour. So if we we're operating at this frequency, normalized frequency of 0.4238, this lattice would self collimate And we can look at the adjacent isocontours and try to get an idea maybe set some kind of threshold on the curvature and say, oh, okay, maybe by the time I get to this line, it's no longer self-collimating, and I can look at the span of frequencies where this self-collimates and assess bandwidth of self-collimation. So as a quick example, what if we wanted to design a self-collimating lattice? Well, I want a lattice that self-collimates at a frequency of 10 gigahertz. How do I do that, given what we've just calculated? Well, at 10 gigahertz, the free space wavelength is 3 centimeters. On the previous slide, we saw that the isocontours were flat at a normalized frequency of 0.4238. That essentially means that A over lambda is 0.4238. Well, we know our free space wavelength, so we bring that free space wavelength over to the right and calculate what A should be. And if we go through the math, 1.27 centimeters. So if we made the spacing, from dielectric cylinder to dielectric cylinder, 1.27 centimeters, we would have a lattice that self collimates at exactly 10 gigahertz. Now let's do the same thing for a hexagonal lattice. And what you'll see is this is a repeat. Everything is very much the same. The directions of the vectors and the shapes of the Berlouin zones and stuff is a little bit different, but the procedure is the same. Hexagonal lattice. The upper left is our unit cell. We define it a very similar way. We have a lattice spacing A. There's a cylinder in here, radius R, with dielectric constant epsilon 1. And the fill region has a dielectric constant of epsilon 2. And I pretty much kept the same parameters as with our square lattice. So what would an extended lattice look like? It would look like this. Now the black lines here aren't really there. I just did that for visualization. It's really just the, the gray and this peach kind of color. So what do we want to know about this lattice? Everything we wanted to know about the last lattice. So let's go ahead and start calculating this stuff. First, we want the direct lattice vectors. Remember, the, the primitive translation vectors point to adjacent sites in the lattice. So we would start here, call that our origin, and we could define these two as our primitive translation vectors. And so that's what our primitive translation vectors would look like. And we get this by working through the geometry. Remember, each angle, if we look at this triangle that I'm highlighting, each of the angles is 60 degrees. Each of the sides is A. So we can work through the geometry and, and figure out what these primitive translation vectors are. So those are the direct lattice vectors. 
Now we want to construct the Wigner Sites primitive cell. And this isn't as obvious as with the square lattice, so we'll do this brute force. We define the Wigner Sites primitive cell as the area of space around some site in the lattice that's closest to this site than any other site in the lattice. So what we'll do is we'll pair this where we're centering our unit cell. We'll, we'll pair it off. We'll look at the adjacent sites one at a time. And what we'll do is we'll draw an intersecting line. And what we'll say is everything on the bottom side of this line is closer to this point than this point. We go to the next adjacent site and draw an intersecting line. Everything on this side is closer to this point than this point. And we pair them off and we keep doing this. We go all the way around. And what we've done is we've boxed off a region of space that's closer to this center site than any of these other adjacent sites. So what does that look like? Well, here's what that looks like. Here's our original site. Here's all the adjacent sites. I drew all the bisecting lines and we're looking at this this area of space bound by those intersecting lines. So this is our Wigner Sites unit cell. And notice that's considerably smaller than the conventional unit cell. Also notice it's rotated 90 degrees. The hexagon is rotated 90 degrees relative to our original hexagonal lattice. And that may or may not be a surprise. Now if we overlay the primitive translation vectors on this lattice, we'll notice that uh, we come halfway the sides come halfway along these primitive translation vectors. Next is the reciprocal lattice vectors. We don't even have to know about hexagonal symmetry. We throw them in our equations and we come up with the reciprocal lattice vectors. Notice our direct lattice vectors have a magnitude closely related to A in some way. Down here the magnitudes are closely related to pi over A. That shouldn't be that surprising. But anyway, we come away with two primitive lattice vectors now of the reciprocal lattice. So primitive reciprocal lattice vectors. So here are our direct and reciprocal lattices side by side. We still have yet to construct the irreducible Berlouin zone and the Berlouin zone, but we're looking at our direct and reciprocal lattices side by side, along with the, the lattice vectors we calculated. Now the Berlouin zone. We construct the Berlouin zone in reciprocal space the exact way we constructed the Wigner site cell in the direct lattice. So we start off the red, this is our reciprocal lattice cell, and we would take this, we would start here and we would pair it off with each of the adjacent cells. And what we end up with is this area of space that's closer to our origin point than any other adjacent points in the lattice. And then if we overlay on top of this Berlouin zone, our reciprocal lattice vectors, here's where, what we get. So again, these faces come halfway up the lattice vectors. And in this case, it's the reciprocal lattice vectors. Again, notice the Berlouin zone is 90 degree rotated from the, the reciprocal lattice. Well, there's additional symmetry and we look at our hexagon, it turns out it has uh, mirror symmetry about this line. So that means we can cut our, our irreducible Berlouin zone now to about half of the hexagon. We have a mirror image about this line. So we can further cut our Berlouin zone in half. So we end up here. And does it have rotational symmetry? Yes, it does. It has 60 degree rotational symmetry. So that cuts this region in half. And this little shaded region, that is now our irreducible Berlouin zone, which is considerably smaller than the full Berlouin zone and many fewer calculations. That's the, the beauty of it. Now we want to identify the key points of symmetry. Well, we would go back to this chart, which has the convention, the naming convention. We will be looking in this plane. And we'll notice gamma is always at the origin. M is along one of the faces and K is along the, the vertex, the diagonal here. So gamma to M to K. Those are our key points of symmetry around the perimeter, perimeter of our irreducible Berlouin zone. And now we want to calculate where those key points of symmetry are numerically 
and always relative to the reciprocal lattice vectors. So gamma is always at zero. M, we notice, is just halfway along T1. So it's just half of T1. This is a little bit harder to derive, but we can get that just by looking at the geometry. And it turns out K is a third of the way along T1 plus a third of the way along T2. We want to choose a path around the irreducible Berlouin zone. And here I'm choosing to go from gamma to K to M. So gamma to K to M. Same thing, given those key points of symmetry, we want to calculate all of the, this whole list of block wave vectors. Maybe we want 100 or 200 points to make the, the bands look smooth and continuous. And like we did with the square lattice, we will iterate over the block wave vector. So given a block wave vector, we will calculate all the eigenvalues. Go to the next block wave vector, calculate all the eigenvalues. And we do this over the entire lattice. And if we have enough points, we see that these eigenvalues line up and form bands. So those are the bands of our hexagonal lattice. But this is ugly. We need to label axes, make smooth continuous lines, etc. And so here's the final band diagram. The, the vertical axis has normalized frequency. The horizontal axis has our key points of symmetry. The bands are smooth and continuous. Lines are thick enough. We drew our Berlouin zone, we drew the irreducible Berlouin zone, and we drew our key points of symmetry. So that's our final band diagram.